Thanks again for staying with Africa News Network, First Fast Live. We toss now to ALN7 residential political analyst Fiso Matlango, who has with him the newsmaker of the day, Dr. Ben Ngubane, who last night resigned his post of the ESCOM board as a chairperson. It's over to you, Fiso. Well, thank you, Ms. Cindy Mabe. Uh, I am live tonight with uh, Dr. Ben Gubane. We do know that he resigned from ESCOM last night, and we have him here for an exclusive interview. Dr. Ngubane, I welcome you to the show. Thank you very much, Fiso. It's the first time I'm on AN7. This is the voice of the majority of the people of this country. You are doing a tremendously good job. Keep it up. You heard that, Cindy, compliments from uh, Dr. Ngubani. Thank you so much. So it's a privilege to, to host you tonight. Um, let's get down to the, the questions of tonight. Uh, you just resigned from your position as a board chair for, for ESCOM. And you have a, a prolific curriculum vitae, having done a lot of work in this country, uh, former premier, former uh, ambassador, you were in the negotiations for peace in KZN. My opening question to you, Dr. Ngubane, is uh, why did you resign from ESCOM, particularly now? Well, I've given all my life to public service in this country. My term at ESCOM ends in June. That will be, would have been my last AGM. I thought long and hard whether I should miss the emerging business opportunities and keep on at my job until end of June, I decided wisely, I think, that I should seek, seize the opportunity and tender my resignation so I can get into private business as quickly as possible. Does, does your resignation, Dr. Ngubane, at this point have anything to do with the, the situation that Mr. Brian Molefe is in? Uh, I don't know what to, to call Mr. Brian Mulef at this point. Uh, is he still the CEO of ESCOM, the former CEO of ESCOM, former member of parliament? Uh, did Mr. Brian Mulefe's situation at this point inform your decision to resign right now? Well, when we make personal decisions, obviously they are also influenced by the environment, by the stresses that are happening and going on by the misunderstandings that are so current. Mm. Obviously, I put that into the equation and I said, I've done my bit, let me look after myself. Mm. Dr. Ngubane, I don't know, as I've said, Mr. Molefe's position at this time. Um, he resigns from ESCOM, goes to, to become a member of parliament. Yeah. Um, he leaves parliament, uh, he becomes the Group CEO for ESCOM once more time. And then the minister, Ms. Lynn Brown, uh, says he's unfit for that position. Uh, and uh, as we speak, Mr. Molefe is not the CEO of ESCOM. Please explain to me what is happening uh, concerning Mr. Molefe and the position of ESCOM CEO. This is a comedy of errors. Molefe took early retirement. The press publicized it as a resignation. Even the minister spoke of it as a resignation, but he didn't resign. When you retire from a company, you can pursue any career, any business, and he did just that by becoming a member of parliament. However, the minister was not happy with the pension payout. She asked us to relook at it, to find a solution, and we did relook at it. We gave her about four options, but Molefe said if he goes, he will then have to go to court to claim his rights. Ultimately, we negotiated with him. We agreed that we'll cancel his early retirement, effectively canceling the pension situation, and effectively him coming back as an employee of ESCOM. That was a very neat solution because then he works for his pension at the end of five years. Now, we are where we are because we tried probably 
to undo something that was quite logical as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. So technically, well, actually I can't say that because this is before the courts. But anyway, Molife returned to his original position at ESCOM. Mm -hmm. I do understand that it's still subjudicate at the moment. Yes. But do you think in any way that uh, Ms. Lynn Brown or the ANC leadership uh, sabotaged Mr. Molife's career because, I mean, at this point, he doesn't have a job. Well, it's a, a very painful thing for me because Brian gave his whole lot to get us out of load shedding. He used to arrive at 5 in the morning and leave at 10 at night. He visited all the power stations, met all the managers, make them sign performance agreements, forced each division to speak to the other in terms of sharing information, which was not the case before. Mm -hmm. The Gain generation was not talking to national control. That is why we're mismatching the megawatts on the system, unable to predict demand, unable to predict when we're going to do outages, mm -hmm. that is planned outages, mm -hmm. It was a total mess. Financially, ESCOM had collapsed. And within the first year, our earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and am amortization EBITDA shot up, and we were able to declare a reasonable profit. Now, these things don't happen by magic. It takes thinking, it takes hard work, and it takes dedication. I've spent my time at ESCO sitting up at night, going through all the figures, through all the reports, so that when you come to a board meeting, I'm informed as a chairman. And management has a respect for a chairman who is informed, who knows the business. That's how we gelled with Brian. We used to sit together, spend a lot of time, discussing the ESCOM business and how to improve it. Now I leave ESCOM in a very positive state in terms of financial, of financial health. We are making a profit, not such a, a huge profit as last year, because the IPPs have cut into our margins. The sales to big business have dropped because the smelters closed some of their ports. We are therefore challenged in terms of revenue, particularly by the debt municipalities owe us, about 9 billion rand. So, but in spite of all that, we have got a very healthy balance sheet. Management works together nicely. They consult each other. It's been a pleasure to work at ESCO. I'm sorry that we have been so misrepresented in the media. One would think it's a collapsing organization, when in fact it is at its strongest today. Mm. Don't you think, Dr. Ngubani, that you needed to stay a little longer and fight for, for black intellectuals or fight for black excellence? Because it is not only uh, Mr. Molefe who's under attack. It's, Odo, it's also Mr. Claudi Mutweneng, who was fired just yesterday. It's, sure. Odo, it's also Ms. Dudumien. It's all the leaders of uh, Paris Statals. Don't you think you needed to fight uh, these external forces that anyone, everyone continues to speak about? Uh, don't you think that you are living prematurely or you are living under a cloud? Isn't it better to fight for a new day for black leaders in this country? Well, the minister had made it clear that in June she will rotate the board. I could not sacrifice the opportunities that were offering themselves to me to wait for the end of the month. It was an intelligent decision. I've given all, as I said, to working for the people of this country. Obviously, it's a thankless job. When you are giving public service, there are no thank yous. One accepts that. But I decided this time that Ngubane and family come first. Mm. Let's talk about the state of capture report. Right. 
Um, Mr. Mulefe was written about in the, the state capture report. Um, Ms. Tulima Donsela indicated that he was found uh, or made calls around the, the Saxon world area. And uh, many of us, and analysts such as myself, continue to say business people can call each other at any point. Uh, Mr. Molefe then um, was heartbroken as I attended the, the yeah. press briefing you, you also spoke at and said for, for his children's sake, he wants to resign from, from ESCOM. Do you think the, the turn of events that are happening at ESCOM and in this country is because of the state of capture report, which we know is an incomplete and an inconclusive report? You know, I was at Cordesa. President Mandela spoke about reconciliation. But reconciliation demands that justice should be done. You cannot reconcile unilaterally. We hoped then that the forces of money, the forces that hold the land and wealth in this country, would understand the meaning of reconciliation. And we use institutions, we would use institutions like NETLAC to work out exactly all those thorny areas in the relationship of the different races in this country, the inequality in terms of wealth, the serious poverty that exists, the, the systematic deprivation of skills to black people by apartheid. We hoped all those things would be on the table, but it didn't happen. That's why we are at this juncture having strident talks about white monopoly capital. We have white monopoly capital trying to defend itself because it thinks it's under threat. Yeah. The fear, mere fact that Brian questioned the 40-year contracts of some 40 or five, I mean of some four or five big companies which under apartheid received 40-year contracts with ESCO and therefore received billions and billions of rent. When he raised the issue of transformation, that it should start there, we have a spend at ESCOM exceeding 50 billion for coal only. Now, that needed to be shared. I think that's when the trouble started for Brian. Mm. He was seen as a cheeky little fellow who dares to question what has been the status quo in this country, and therefore, all the guns were unleashed. They are being unleashed on all of us. Mm. Black intelligence here. I mean, unfortunately, our own people are actually in the vanguard of this onslaught. It is a very disturbing. I mean, I have read a lot about democratic transitions, which have happened in Spain, in Latin America, moving from rule by the junta, academics, intellectuals leading the charge for freedom. And it's been said that initially the elite in a democratic transition scrapple and take time mm -hmm. to understand how to handle the levers and operate the levers of power. Here it's been the opposite. We went in through, under the leadership of President Mandela, through to now, starting from a very strong ability to govern and acceptance of our capacity to govern. But gradually, this has been eroding. Gradually, if you are black in this country, you are corrupt, you are incompetent, mm -hmm. and they forget that to be competent, you need to be trained and skilled and most of us didn't have the skills. The earlier vanguard troop for our liberation is now retired, is grown old, and then the deficiencies are coming through. Most of our people who came in to liberate us were trained overseas, mm -hmm. universities overseas, and so on. Those people are going off. What we are remaining with is the emerging intelligentsia which unfortunately is being fed poison when they are being taught yeah. at institutions 
that have not transformed. Dr. Ngobani, you speak so eloquently on, on white monopoly capital, uh, but some of the comrades you worked with in the then government of national unity um, and the government just after democracy are today denying the existence of white monopoly capital. These are, these are struggles, stalwarts, that you, you set with in Codesa in negotiations. And they know that the ANC was uh, outmaneuvered. And they are aware that uh, black people only own 3% of the economy. But it is these cadres and comrades today that are denying the existence of uh, white monopoly capital. Well, what do you think of that? Well, probably I shouldn't defame people. But I was shocked when Trevor Manuel made those statements. You know, I'd had a lot of respect for him. But I was absolutely shocked. Because everyone knows that 34 million families were moved from their homes, their land, in order to implement the Group Areas Act. Very painful. First of its kind in modern history, that there were such huge and forced movement of people. Now, how can a comrade say that there is no white such thing as white monopoly capital? Land is wealth. If I give you land, I've given you wealth. If I deprive you of land, you will never be wealthy whatever you do, it, because you'll only be receiving crumbs from the table of the master. So that speech by, or those remarks by him were absolutely shocking. I even doubt whether he ever understood what the struggle meant. Mm. It is not Mr. Trevor Manuel alone, I hasten to say. Um, the, the likes of Mr. Tera Lekota, Museo Lekota, uh, leader of COPE, the Congress of the People, uh, say land was not taken away from black people. And uh, black people don't deserve land because uh, they, are, they are not owed any land from any other group in this country. I think those comments water down the work you did at CODESA, Dr. Nguban. Well, probably must have elementary history lessons. When Van Riebeek arrived in the Cape, they killed the Khoi. They brought in smallpox infected clothing and blankets to give to the Khoi. It decimated them and the land was taken. Then there was continuous land grabs right through Southern Africa. So I don't know where Lakota lives or what books he reads, because 1913 was not, we're, we're being very generous when we say 1913. It goes right back. King Shaga had huge territories. So did people in the Eastern Cape. So did people in the North, all under traditional leadership. Mm. We, where is Mamburu today? Mm -hmm. Dr. Ngobani, you, you, I, I, you're quoted as saying that state capture started in 1948. That was the exact state capture by the National Party sure. government. Sure. And what we see today is a big hooray and very vociferous utterances uh, by people who are anti-black. But no one wants to recall that state capture happened in uh, 1948. Talk to me about that. Well, as I said, 34 million people were, were removed from their lands to give that land to white people under the Group Areas Act. Mm -hmm. That was state capture. Then when it came to business, there was job reservation. Mm -hmm. You were not allowed to study and acquire many critical skills because it served job reservation. That was state capture. Dr. Nguban, are these the, the same groups that uh, want to capture ESCOM or have captured ESCOM throughout the years? And I'm referring to the 40-year contracts yes. that ESCOM had given to certain families. Right. And uh, those contracts are coming to an end. Yes. And that's why there's such hostility against you and Mr. Molefe, I believe. Uh, talk to me about those families and how they have captured ESCOM throughout the years. Well, it was given because of the contracts. 
you couldn't touch those contracts. Certainly now that they are coming to the end, we are introducing new junior miners. We are even in manufacturing, we are trying to create skills and ability through our academy of learning and training. So it's, it's a given. Our life in South Africa has been one of being captured. Yeah. Which other group used to be woken up at night at three in the morning by the knock on the door by the police looking for passes? That was our life, mm. the experience of our parents. And the largest coal suppliers are still, you know, the likes of... Uh, of course. Uh, Anglo-American, Exaro. Absolutely. And if there's a small player that comes in at ESCOM, he is kicked out because of yeah. these long-term contracts. You would think that people would understand that they have to share the wealth and the opportunity. We had expected that the big players would train junior miners and probably open up a seam in, in the mine and say, you must look after this mm. in partnership with us. We will help you so that you can grow the expertise and be big operators. It doesn't happen. So white monopoly capital then had seized ESCOM for all these years. Absolutely. And now uh, the talk is that radical economic transformation must come. I is this why there is such a reaction, a negative reaction to, to radical economic transformation? Because white monopoly capital had captured ESCOM over the years, as you say. Absolutely. Not only ESCOM. I mean, we are said to be in recession today. Mm. But how much money lies in the banks uninvested? It has been said that there are no bankable plans, no bankable projects. That's why manufacturing is not being promoted. It's a systematic way of strangling this black government. The NC must wake up to that. It's being strangled. When we increase manufacturing in the country, you increase jobs. But to do that, you need skilled workers. And those skilled workers will earn more and higher wages. And therefore, the purchasing power of the economy will improve year by year. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you have a, a thriving economy that is export-oriented, that can provide a living wage, not just the minimum wage, to everybody. But that means the people must be reskilled, and the majority of our people were never given skills. Mm -hmm. So the capture. We need a whole seminar mm -hmm. to discuss this issue because mm -hmm. it's so fundamental to the mm -hmm. future of this country. Dr. Nguban, do you think that our national treasury has assisted, encouraged, or facilitated the, the capture or the oppression of ESCOM and maybe other state-owned enterprises? Absolutely. You know, we, we have submitted report after report to national treasury. They only pick out those pieces that want to indicate that our prepayment to Tegeta was wrong. They have even said it must be called, called a loan. We bought coal from Tegeta mm -hmm. at the height of winter when we didn't have the reserves. The coal came, so it was paid for. The internal audit certified that the amount we paid as prepayment had bought the equivalent amount of coal. Now, how can you query this and say this must be a loan when, in fact, you have bought goods that are demonstrably there and of good quality? The, the test of a good supply of coal mm -hmm. is that the power stations can burn it and generate the requisite megawatts into the national grid. Mm -hmm. All the, the stations do that because the coal is right. There will be batches of coal from certain seams in the ground that do not produce the same gigajoules as required. Those are called reject coal, and ESCOM does not pay for them. So this talk that we bought inferior coal from Tegeta, when Machuba is working perfectly, producing the required megawatts, is absolute nonsense. It's just a way of finding fault with ESCOM, to give the impression 
that a favor was done to Tegeta, that we did not do the right procurement processes, and so on. So, I, you know, I said in Parliament, four power stations did not have the required 28-day supplies of coal, which we need for every winter. Okay. Then they sorted that out, but still two more do not have adequate supplies. In fact, you require 28-day supply. Mm. These two others have only 14 days of supply. It's a danger in terms of our sustainability of electricity. This has come about because Treasury has decided to take away the power from ESCOM mm. to procure coal. ESCOM is a, an electricity company. People sit in Treasury, they have no idea how el electricity is generated. Yeah. They are now insisting that they are going to see uh, Exaro, they will have a meeting with Exaro. Exaro said in its, on its documents, they cannot supply the quality of coal that we need. Yes, sir. They said so. But Treasury still insists that we must buy from them. So what is this? To me, radical transformation must start with the Treasury. And I'm not done with that, sir. I want to get deeper into Treasury. Before we go on, uh, I need to take a break. Uh, let's, let's go to a break. More after this with uh, Dr. Ngubani.